can see. Hang on. <laughs> okay, we're live. Um, yes. We before we began recording, we were talking about um, winging it, as it were, uh, and presentations based on um, quickly put together, highly spontaneous <laughs> preparation techniques. So, um, how? Do you guys like to write your presentations? A, on I'm saying this like I'm taking a poll. Um, you actually could respond here if you go to the page for the event. But anyway, A, um, on the airplane. B, on the toilet. Or C, in the office. So, let us know at uh, Software Underground. That's swung dot rocks to to uh, sign up for this poll. And if you sign up for this poll you're actually going to have to write the poll because um, I'm not writing. <laughs> okay, so uh, Gerard says he likes to write uh, presentations on airplanes. Yeah? Yeah, that's true. And the irony on listening to this that knows me is going to be like, you know, think that this was a run-up or a dig to me because I'm always a person doing it like before the actual talk. Like at EAGE, I was literally still ed editing my slides, adding in some last minute results and I got my intern to get up to run down the corridor to <laughs> upload the newest version of the <laughs> presentation like you know, 20 minutes before we were going live. <laughs> Uh, and, and the irony being that this conversation started off just now about how I was actually prepared. <laughs> it's right. so, shock horror. Never Ger happens. Gerard has put an awesome amount of material into our show notes. You guys should go check it out. There's a link in the description of this thing. Uh, and it has links to all of his projects. It's got descriptions of everything it's doing. It is amazing, and we're going to run through it all. Uh, during the podcast, which I'm not sure if we've actually started the podcast yet or not. But anyway, uh, if we have started the podcast, uh, we're under sampled radio. This is uh, episode uh, 16, um, and we have <laughs> we have a very special guest for you today. I'm not sure if you can guess who it is, um, but we'll introduce him soon. Um, uh, in the in the meantime, I'd like to say a couple things about news first. Unity 3D, the uh, gaming platform builder thingy, is uh, started started a new collaboration feature set called Unity Colab, and it's still in beta. And I'm not sure you can you can apply for the beta. You don't have to be invited. Um, and so I'm waiting and waiting and waiting on my application to be accepted. Um, but it should be pretty cool because the Unity the stuff you build in Unity is so big. It's you know it's got all these huge objects and big object files and all this stuff. So it's gigabytes and gigabytes and gigabytes. Um, so it's a pain in the butt to share it on GitHub. Um, so get pumped about Unity Colab. I'll be there. And guess what I'm going to put up? Some virtual reality seismic visualization system, which I've been working on for a little while. No idea what I'm doing. No idea what I'm talking about. But um, you're going to be able to play with seismic data on the HTC Vive. And also, I will put a, um, a non-VR version, which is just like a 3D rendering thingamablob, up there. Um, if you want it, it's not quite ready to go yet, but I'm hoping a week it'll be ready. Um, let me know it's, uh, if, you, if you've ever used any of these 3D interpretation tools that cost $100,000 a year or whatever. This isn't as good. But <laughs> it is free, so you can check it out. Um, and then when it's on Unity Colab, I'll post it on Twitter and what have you. Um, so Unity Colab, it's it's kind of like GitHub, is it? But for Unity projects, so it, hold, it holds everything, the objects and the code. Yes, I believe so. Now again, I haven't used it yet because I haven't been accepted. But I, it sounds like it's a it's a version control system, um, live and direct. So I'm pretty excited about it. <clears throat> Should be pretty cool. I'm in, I've been wanting to share my project with someone who knows more than I do, and it's hard to do it without GitHub. And and you can still do it on GitHub. You have to use their what do they call it large file system service something like that. I don't know. Yeah, you run out of space pretty quickly. We try to use it, particularly when you're doing anything that relates to seismic. <laughs> I tell you, I yeah, like the the other people's idea of a big file and your idea of a big file don't quite match up. <laughs> <laughs> I put a uh, a 
note out on Twitter the other day, and I said uh, I was just kind of like physically organizing the the hard drives and stuff I have in the office. I put a note out that said I, I have like I can't remember now twenty or twenty five terabytes worth of drives here, and I said, "Is that a lot of storage? What do you guys think?" And uh, it was really cool, man. We got all or I got all these replies in about everybody's little. Uh, domain-specific um, needs for storage, which was cool. I had mo uh, movie people, like Hollywood movie people, say, oh, blah, 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 however many movies can fit on this space. Or <laughs> we had some LiDAR people talk, uh, come back with us. Um, it, it was cool. So it's big. It's uh, heavy data, whatever. Um, but we're all doing it, man. Mm -hmm. Graham, okay. let me yeah. ask you. I say one thing, like we've been playing around a bit as well with Oculus Rift, uh, just for a different application. So the f the first problem we ran into, at least in the first day of usage, was nausea. Like, you know, <laughs> oh, yeah. how, how have you been getting, like, not being smart or anything, but we were looking up then ways to reduce nausea, and yeah. drinking beer actually was one of them, which I thought was, was it. Cool. Yeah. <laughs> so, how, how many things did you try? <laughs> <laughs> well, tequila doesn't work. That's the only list. <laughs> uh, um, but, but what's your really experience? Like, I know that people are trying to work on this, reduce the nausea, these types of effects. Was this a problem for you? Yeah, uh, it, it remains a problem for me. I so hmm. um, I w as I say, I had no idea what I was doing. So I just started throwing things into VR, and initially it was all good. But then you'll just do one little tweak. For example, like. Uh, you're able to walk around the scene just using a trackpad. That made me so sick. Um, and so I just had to turn it off. It was, t it was completely unusable. Um, and then other little things. For example, I, I took a photosphere with my phone of where I stand when I'm in my VR system. So basically, when you put the goggles on, you're just right where you were again. Except that it's slightly off, so like the tracking is just barely slightly off. That made me so sick. Mm -hmm. um, so I don't know, trial and error, just like you. I haven't tried beer yet, but now that you say it, obviously I'm going to get there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but I think it's quite cool. Like I think the only way, I think it is quite tricky to get this working properly. But I think what I'm quite excited about is as as long as there's a community of people out there tricking with it, mm -hmm. like then like because the trial and error for one person quite sucks, right? It takes you right. ages. Uh, but when you have a whole community of people doing trial and error and sharing it, and, and I thought hopefully this is a fun thing as well, so it'll get more buy-in from people just being able to trick it around with it. Um, I can't. I'm trying. And I'm, yeah, on, I put it on my expenses, so the kids love it, right? <laughs> yes, yes. I'm on um, Google right now. I'm trying to find the word. Isn't there a, a a new word for VR sickness other than VR sickness? The opposite of so. Uh, so here's my understanding. <laughs> Let me explain something that I know nothing about. Again, uh, <laughs> I when when you're on the boat and you're motion sick, it's because you you're cochlear fluid is moving, but you, your sense, your visual perception isn't moving, right? Um, but in VR, it's the opposite, right? So your visual perception is moving, but your fluid is stationary, uh, or some relatively stationary. Do, so, Gerard, do you know the, they, they came up with a word for this, like, photo, not... Yeah, I'm just having a quick look as well. I got my, I got, I found my list, 11 ways to prevent uh, motion sickness. Well, they're calling it motion sickness here. Yeah, I can yeah. find it. Um, yeah, um, definitely. If you Google this, you'll definitely see beer comes up here quite high. Get wow. drunk. It's like, oh, actually, they said 11, so um, 14 has apparently become the new 11, <laughs> and uh, number 12 is get drunk. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay, I can't find it, but I'll put a link in the show notes. Okay, um, so I've got one more news point, and uh, what is it? Oh yeah, it's my last. Uh, fleeting call to Bar Camp NOLA. There's a link in the show notes. Check it out. Come see us. It's this weekend in New Orleans, Saturday and Sunday. Saturday is the unconference. You can just randomly show up and present something you know something about. Or like me, you can show up and present something you don't know what you're talking about. Um, so that's all day Saturday starting at 9.30. And then on Sunday is a hack day. Um, there's going to be a bunch of people to get together and work on little problems. Um, so the website, if you don't see the show notes, is barcampnola, N-O-L-A, dot com. So without further ado, let's introduce our guest. <laughs> hey, Matt, take it away. <laughs> um, right, so Gerard, 
uh, Gerard Gorman, hi, um, who I only just met really uh, in, um, uh, where were we? <laughs> we were in EGE, uh, EG, right, in, uh, in Austria, Vienna, Austria, um, where Gerard was like a, a really awesome, <laughs> uh, I hope this comes out right, because I mean it as a compliment, <laughs> but <laughs> I, so he was in the, um, you were in the, the open source workshop. And I really liked it when you, uh, when every time you spoke, because you said what I was thinking, but was incapable of expressing without being sarcastic and insulting half the people in the room. <laughs> so uh, I, pr I really appreciated your tact and uh, diplomacy, uh, as well as your ideas. Um, so he's a, a reader at Imperial College London, uh, where I, I also know lots of other awesome people. So it seems like a great place to be. And um, links to Twitter and uh, GitHub are in the show notes. Um, Gerard, hi. Where are you right now? Um, so I'm hanging out in a meeting room in Imperial College London. So things have got a bit quieter, thankfully. I've got a whole bunch of uh, interns with me for the summer, uh, which means I can no longer fit in my office, So which is why I'm hanging out here. Uh, but so it's great. It's good fun. Lots of people doing interesting stuff. Where are they working? Where are these uh, interns from? Um, so it's quite cool. Um, one comes from um, from the US. Uh, well, now I try and struggle to remember which university. But he's actually a cool guy. I met him at uh, when I was at Supercomputing last year. Uh, I was at the HBC uh, like startup uh, workshop. And there was this odd guy there that was an undergraduate and got chatting to him. And I said, oh, well, come over here and do an internship. So currently he's doing lots of hacking for me on uh, the new Intel Knight's Landing, say, on an Intel project that's doing seismic-related stuff. Hmm. Um, then someone else then is from north of England. Uh, and then two other guys are actually just from local local computer science, like, say, the computer science uh, department here. Um, so they're all sort of computer-type people that uh, like, you know, have a good background in maths, basically. Right, right. But I, I guess I'm accustomed to thinking of the the slave labour around universities being done by grad students and whatnot. But these are these are undergrads who are looking for something to do during the summer. Yeah. And, and the paid positions. Well, it's, yeah, it's because it's really quite. Uh, I think it's a good scheme that they have. Um, so it's just a particular program where, yeah, they, they, it's, it's much more productive than working at McDonald's, uh, right? Uh, and and like very often, like you know, they're, 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 there's a lot of sort of bright kids out there. And I think it, this is a really good opportunity because it's not so expensive. You can try some maybe some crazy ideas, uh, like you know stuff that you haven't got quite time to look at. Like say for example, like uh, one of them is working with Open Cascade, and Open Cascade is is a really cool like uh, open source project. Um, like you know it's one of the few like open source projects out there for dealing with CAD and all that type of stuff. Uh, but it's, it's a real pain to get to grips with the API. So a couple of times I sat down, read it, and then I just didn't have the time. And um, so it was great. Like you know, I got him to start focusing on it instead. He mocks up some stuff. So like I give him a specification. I say, okay, look, try and write these unit tests that to do some basic stuff that I'm interested in integrating with something else. So he spends a few days like RTFMing. And uh, like you know, going through the forums, figuring out how to get the damn thing working, and uh, and then like you know, he writes up on GitHub. Like it's a little open source project up there at the moment. If someone wants to go to my GitHub page, uh, so it's open source, and like you know, then he'll just put together the example and show how, like how exactly you use this uh, thing. The other one is, uh, and this is where I got talking to Graham originally, was uh, I was trying to um, basically mod some video games. Um, so, so a lot of video games are quite cool because it's, they have like millions and millions, like you know, uh, poured into them for their uh, for the development, make them look really cool and stuff. And like, and being scientists, like you know, we're really usually quite uh, rubbish about uh, communicating what we do <laughs> to to mortals and non specialists. So we had some ideas about just taking some of these games that had good f realistic physics models and then modding them for our purposes so that we could illustrate what it is that we were trying to do. Um, so this was this was another thing then like the the, the undergraduates like uh, interns love it because like they're doing gaming like you know I was ordering the steering wheel and everything off eBay for them. <laughs> like, you know people come in it's, it's difficult to convince them you're actually working. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. The lab sounds pretty awesome. Yeah, and then because a lot of this stuff, like you know, it sounds as if it should be straightforward, but can seriously burn into your time as well. Mm -hmm. So uh, yeah, so I think it's a cool scheme. It's a lot of fun. Yeah. 
And ha so, um, what sort of what's your setup at Imperial? You it sounds like you have um, a, a bit of a lab scene going on. Like, how long have you been there? And what's your um, master plan for world domination out of Imperial? Oh, the master plan. Well, I could tell you, but then I'd have to kill you. All those types of things. Um, so I'm part of a very sort of diffuse group across uh, Imperial. Um, so I'm based in the Earth Science and Engineering Department. Um, but like an awful lot, like historically, I've been doing a lot of uh, interdisciplinary work. So I have done my time doing CFD, doing uh, ocean modeling, doing like you know more CS and high performance computing than what's healthy. Um, and they, and then say our group. Then so we have a large team of uh, model developers like that focus on things that are geophysical and even industrial CFD. Uh, inside this department, uh, but then also with the maths department, we have very strong links. With the computer science department, we have really strong links. And it's been quite interesting. I, I guess I've been here for such a long time. And it's been good from the point that there's a lot of interesting stuff that you can do, like say on the boundaries between like stuff that we're interested in for geophysics, and, like you know the applied stuff that gets things done. Um, and then on the other ha hand, there's cool stuff going on in CS, and there's cool stuff going on in maths, but it takes a long time to learn other people's language. Mm -hmm. So I guess the cool thing here is that it is a sort of diffuse group throughout the college now, but like over the years, we've finally figured out how to like you know vaguely understand what the other people are talking about, yeah. and then so then the, and then so I think it's an exciting area of research then where you can sort of really exploit their cutting edge stuff and you actually give it some context then, so it doesn't okay. become just an academic toy thing from them. They're excited by seeing it going into a real application, doing real stuff as well. But I mean, a lot of people talk about you know interdisciplinary research and so on and. Uh, I, I, you know, I, I just often feel like once you start talking to them, actually, they, it, you know, it means that they got someone from computer science into their lab, but now they're in their lab, and you know, they sort of convert people with different backgrounds. But it sounds like you guys are actually maintaining real links with these other with with these other departments. Like, how, how do you? What are the sort of if there if there were one or two secret uh, secrets to that kind of ongoing collaboration? What, what would you say those are? Beer. Yeah. <laughs> main, main, main <laughs> that seems one. to be a common theme over there. Uh, well, maybe uh, socializing uh, is one of the important things, you know. Yes. Uh, and, and yes, like, yeah, you guessed me, okay? Um, <laughs> like, I think a, a really important part of it is communication. And, like, I think you're in the wrong business, I think, if, if you're not doing this kind of stuff and if you don't think it's fun. Mm. Uh, like I think you've got you really have to sort of question your career choices, yeah. like you know if you don't find this fun. And it is fun to talk about stuff, and it should be fun to talk to these guys and figure out what they're doing. And it might make your head hurt from time to time. Say, oh my god, like I have no idea what you're talking about. Can I try and figure out how this might be of use to me? Mm. But then it's very rewarding. But as long as you treat it like you know as a fun process, because it is fun, and then you can create stuff and all the rest. But it doesn't happen overnight. I don't know if you have to learn a new discipline or something, or like at least understand it. Like it might take an investment of uh, of years even, uh, but it's it's tremendously rewarding, I think. And I think that really, if you want to do something interesting as well, like I think you have to be happy with you know, mixing things up and working on the boundaries and uh, having fun understanding what other people are doing. And and emitting like you know saying I have no idea what you're talking about like grabbing people for help like asking questions and not be afraid to be stupid. Mm -hmm. So when it's someone like me like you know I, I absolutely have no shame whatsoever. So I'll ask any kind of a question without any regard for how stupid it might be. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, but uh, but but I think in general I think this is this is an important thing like you know people people communicate and have fun and try and build stuff. Mm. So what kind of stuff are you guys building? What's your what's your number one project you're working on right now? <clears throat> so I've got two number one projects. So, <laughs> uh, but like, okay, so, but the, okay. So the one that's really relevant here, I guess, is this uh, Opeshi project. So this, I, I think, this is a quite uh, one thing actually. That's a theme that goes through nearly everything that I do and say, and that I'm involved in. I just forget to say it so much. Yeah, I mean. We get to say it when you take it for granted too much is uh, open source, and I guess uh, this this is one thing that really struck me because I, I'm relatively new to the exploration community, 
Uh, I really only got into this subject, uh, like you know, like maybe about two years ago. So I've had an awful lot of learning to do. But what I found is moving from other application areas and sectors into this area, like it's a lot more closed than perhaps any other area I've worked in. Like I, I think I could probably find more open source code for nuclear engineering than I, or like you know something else has, that has uh, national sensitivity issues, security issues associated with the, the oil and gas industry. It's quite insane. Um, so I, th I think it's worth like you know nearly just highlighting that because I do think it's strange and I think even from the EAD uh, workshop. So I think w maybe your first interaction with me there was when I exploded at someone's comment, and it's just that, like uh, there's, a, cause there's too many people who who maybe are only working inside this area uh, of geophysics and they haven't actually realized that in many ways their their attitudes towards open innovation is actually quite strange and completely out of kilter. With a lot of modern, um, like you know, commercialization and like a lot of modern business, mm -hmm. uh, and I'm saying this uh, as a startup as well, like you know, not just as a hippie academic, uh, lefty <laughs> academic or something else. Like you know, I think it's important to distinguish these things. Uh, well, we will talk about your startup in a minute because it's actually fascinating. But um, let's talk about um, Opeshi first. Um, first of all, for those of us who don't know, what is it? Okay, so it, this is a project funded by uh, Intel, so they made sure it was open source. It's a collaboration between uh, the, the, ourselves at Imperial, the Sinbad Group at uh, USB, um, at UBS, sorry, USB, my God, um, and Sinai Cinetech in Brazil. Um, so what the focus really here is, it's first uh, seismic imaging. Uh, and the, really the problem, I guess, that we're trying to solve is that there's like the like computers are getting more and more challenging to optimize code for. You've got a lot of heterogeneity in the in computers, so you've got multi-core, this, that, and the other. Like every time you go to a supercomputing conference, it seems like people have invented like you know ten new uh, parallel programming paradigms that you should rewrite all of your code in and. And, and it gets pretty hard because, like, I think, uh, well, it, well, hard and it can be fun, depending on what your perspective is, because uh, for doing something like imaging, like inversion, it's quite, a, it's quite an interesting problem. Like, it's really complex. You have got a bunch of maths in there. You have to know your numerical methods for discretizing all of your physics correctly. Then you have to go and implement all of that stuff. Then you have to make sure that your discretization is properly verified. Now you have to optimize it for one architecture and probably like a number of different architectures, depending on how, uh, like you know, how good a sales pitch a particular vendor did to you that you bought their special uh, multi-core magic sauce. Um, and, and like quite quickly, you end up with hundreds and thousands of lines of impenetrable code. Um, that can, no one can make head nor tail of, and you have absolutely no ability to innovate. So as soon then as you get your like you know very um, like interesting like you know uh, mathematician collaborator to come up with a new discretization that's going to do wonderful stuff for what you're trying to do and be much more efficient and accurate, and then you say fantastic. Now all I need is a PhD student, and hopefully they'll get implemented sometime within the next three years. And then, if it turns out to be interesting, and they manage to get it work, like you know, we'll pay like you know another specialist, whatever, another number of years to optimize it and whatever architecture. So the value proposition from our perspective is, well, it's a lot of repetitive stuff. Like, can we use code generation? So this is the whole thing of, like, what they call domain specific languages or like DSLs, like code generation. So what we try to do is start at everything at a very high level. So like at a mathematical level. We exploit things like symbolic math engines, like uh, SymPy, like symbolic Python, uh, which is another great open source package. So, uh, like when we have that high level representation, and then at the back end of that, so I say this then is why I was sort of building up. Why do we collaborate and talk to other people? So the other team of people that I work with then they uh, write compilers for a living. Um, so we basically write our own back end then for things like SymPy where we take all of our maths for doing all our cool like uh, propagators and adjoints and whatnot. Um, and then the, because it's already an abstract form and because we know where we want to go with it, we're able to generate all of the code for it. Hmm. And then the really cool thing is that we can be very aggressive about the optimizations. So all those really painful hand-tuning optimizations that like no one in the right mind would implement, or even if you do implement it, like you know, it's completely unmaintainable. Um, like you don't care because just the computer goes and does it all for you. 
Um, so at the moment, like our code base that does all of the work, we, like we have got acoustic for like 3D, you've got your VTI, TTIs, and adjoints associated with all of that. Our entire code base is 3,000 lines of code. Nice. Uh, written written in uh, written in Python, which is basically our compiler, and uh, e even that three thousand lines, I think, is about five hundred of those are just to read those damn say Y files. Yeah. <laughs> it's like once again, is there ever a case for or like an open source stack inside uh, in, in, in this community? That must be it. Um, but then with the code then that's actually generated automatically, like the low level C code that's factorized and what have you. Um, like that, that runs into like you know, like many hundreds and thousands of lines uh, mm -hmm. right off the bat. Uh, but like humans didn't have to write that. That's the key thing. So it's great mm -hmm. then. Like you know, if we have new discretization, it's an afternoon's work then to for a geophysicist to write something in a high-level language that's actually palatable. Mm -hmm. And and then the symbolic math engine does the really horrendous uh, like the, the uh, calculus for you and expansions and whatnot. And then when the code is generated, like you turn on a bunch of your compiler technologies that does the code generation and auto tuning, and and uh, you've got code that's running at uh, near peak of the machine. Hmm. Uh, so that's it's, it's not a case of saying uh, because what I do, what this whole project, I guess, and uh, maybe what the tagline for this project is. This is supposed to be an elevator pitch, right? You really want to be a very <laughs> high building for me. <laughs> um, but I guess the, 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 always like people like to quip that, uh, like say when they talk about high level languages, that uh, you can either have good abstractions, high level abstractions, uh, like in a high level language, or you uh, are performance, but you can never have both. Mm -hmm. And I guess uh, that's ignoring that there's this whole body of work focused on code generation where this is exactly what you get. You do get both. Mm -hmm. uh, but it's a, lot of, it's, it's a lot of fun. We're having a lot of fun with this. It's exciting for uh, dummies like me who don't know anything about coding and uh, prefer to focus on physics. Like, yeah, it's exciting for dummies like me. Like I, I'm just mainly the cheerleader here. I get a bunch of smart people. I buy them lots of beer. I <laughs> see nice things. And I say, we work harder. No program it quicker. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Um, so there, there's links in our show notes to um, to the GitHub page where you can find all of this stuff, and to um, Simpy if you if you want to take a look at that. Um, I want to move forward and talk about your commercial activities. So Gerard's got a startup called London Computational Solutions, um, which looks awesome, and I'll let him explain why. Okay. So with um so this is interesting because this is nothing at all got to do with seismic. So all the stuff I was just talking about has nothing to do with it. Um, so that's why I meant I have two number one projects, as it were. Uh, but in terms of philosophy, it's actually pretty much identical. So once again, like here, we're more talking about CFD. So in this case, we're largely targeting uh, high-end engineering applications. Um, so I think one of the one of if you go on the website, you'll see one of the case studies is focusing on uh, maximizing, well, calculating the downforce on a track on a track car. Um, so this is elemental car. So so largely, what it boils down to is if you want to get around a corner. Uh, and you want to get around it very quick, like you know, it all basically boils down to what friction your tires are experiencing while you are doing the cornering. And the more downforce that you have, that's coming from your speed. Like you know, the more downforce you have, the more friction you have in the tires, so you can get around that corner really quickly. So then, like, there's a, there's, so there's a lot of interest then in terms of designing, uh, like you know, sports vehicles, um, to to maximize your downforce. So the, the 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 way this is often explained is it's just like getting an aircraft wing and turning it upside down. It's pushing you into the ground. Um, so that, so that's that's pretty good. So that's a good example of the kind of thing that we try to do then. Um, but in terms of how we actually, but I think from a technology perspective, and even from an open source perspective, like say the main, um, we're all we're built upon code generation again. So all this is finite element. Uh, Metas where, like for the seismic stuff, is of course mostly finite difference. Uh, but again, it's all about code generation. Um, so at the top level, we're still writing stuff in Python, and we're writing stuff that actually looks like mathematics, uh, like you know, using the unified form language. Um, uh, so this is related to the sister project as well, which is Phoenix project, which I also encourage you to take a look at. Uh, 
and 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 then the same the same uh, like actually there's a lot of similar actors between the two projects like once again from the CES team they're all compiler people to say well how do we get from this high level abstraction down to low level code which is fast like you know this is all focused on supercomputers um, so we all it's it's all focused on vectorizing everything parallelizing everything. Um, and it's like no compromise type performance um, stuff. But then it's but then you go from you go from having like you know this amount of Python like you know as I wave my hands at the radio like how insane is that? But anyway, like you know having a screen full of like you know Python that you can actually like you know trick yourself into thinking that you can comprehend like you know that you can you can sort of see what's going on there from a simulation point of view into like something that's going to run like you know at really good performance on a supercomputer for example just because you're exploiting this. Um, so I think then where wh where the commercial aspect comes into it is uh, like of course the basic technology is all open source, but then it just like that's your open source stack you build, but then you actually want to b develop a solution for the client. So you're 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 looking on people who actually have got something very demanding from a computational perspective. And then the nice thing is because because we have a great uh, expressibility, as it were, because we have great agility and expressibility in terms of how we can put together models and choose our, our, our numerical methods, like we were able to tune the heck out of it for a particular application. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, so the, the customer or whoever, like the end user, ends up with something that's really bespoke for their particular problem and, and really highly tuned for their particular problem. And it's a case of if you want to solve a different problem, well, no problem. Like you just, like you know, now you just create another specialized tool that's just for that. But because you are using uh, this high, this high-level abstractions, and you're exploiting all this code generation business, it makes it easy for you just to create these other tools. Yeah. So the way I like to describe it is, it's nearly like move where the, the difference with like mobile phones. I say we have moved away from rather than having one ma monolithic application for everything, is that you just have a bunch of apps that have got really like you know simple user interfaces that are easy to use and all the rest, and then all the magic happens out the back end. That's right, the right. dream. And how do, uh, how do, do when you talk to your clients about um, about the open source aspect, do they do any of them react to that? Or how do they feel about um, you know the IP and Sort of owning their solution, that kind of thing. Yeah, well, yeah, it really does come up. Um, so it varies quite a lot. Like I said, and this is what I was reflecting on earlier on. It varies quite a bit from sector to sector, and it's largely a cultural issue. Like you know how familiar they are with it, mm. or indeed like how familiar their team of lawyers are with it. <laughs> like, cause that's what it really boils down to, right? And uh, like you know, you 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 know the way it goes with a lawyer to see and something new. Oh, that doesn't look like the previous template that I my favorite template that I have. And then they freak out, and then you're you 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 spend ages discussing it with them. So uh, what it varies. So it boils down to this. Like number one, like yeah, lots of clients are really sensitive. So like some people we can't mention their name or application or anything else. Like that's how sensitive they are about IP. Um, but mostly they get it. They get the fact that there's one layer of stuff that's open and it's generic and everyone is using it. And I think big big announcements like uh, Google, for example, with their TensorFlow and making this open source, like there's so many of these very public um, like announcements and awareness of these massive open source projects inside business. Like people are getting it, oh, this is actually the norm. Yeah. And people then actually understand that uh, what's actually really valuable then is is the stuff that's bespoke for your business. Like actually, what is what is the thing that's making you money? Okay, yeah. and the thing that's making you money, your 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 core business concern is is usually much more compact around IP than that. Mm -hmm. um, so as long as you're as long as you're fixing that specific problem that they're having and you're giving them the competitive advantage and whatnot, they're happy. Um, and then, of course, as well, uh, th then we are able to exploit the fact because we have all of this agility, we can also be uh, very bespoke about what we do. So the fact is, then, if they want a tool to do blah, and they want that to be completely proprietary, uh, well, then, like you know, it's uh, cost effective for us. Like you know, we're able to create that specialized custom thing just for them, and they, and they can like they can they can and they can buy it outright and buy the exclusivity of it. Mm -hmm. uh, like, but, like, but that doesn't touch the background IP, which is open source. And how, how, what percentage of clients do you find prefer that setup to fully uh, have the backend open source? 
Um, has it having everything open source? Sorry, maybe maybe yeah. give me your question again. Um, what what percentage of your clients do you find uh, will buy everything outright and keep the entire stack uh, proprietary? Um, in terms of what they do, I think like I think the the knee jerk reaction for everyone is to want to know everything. And they want to own everything and keep everything to themselves. And I think so. There's always work to do to explain to them what it is that they're actually owning and what's theirs and what's actually valuable for them to have, so that you're not really being sort of silly about it. So there's I guess my question is, how many times does that pitch fail, and uh, they 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 end up saying no, we want we want them. So this is interesting because uh, so I think it's a, been a work in progress. Um, Understanding the answer to that question, because I would see like I, I think I have more or less gone through like you know a, a large number of years of failure, because we were always making this pitch right and 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 people were never really picking up on us and we're getting ignored and we weren't really getting a, a traction, and then like it was like you know f you know finally the penny was dropping as it were trying to figure out well what was it that the real concern was and what they were actually looking for. And very often, like it still goes back to the point that ultimately, if if someone is being reasonably rational, and uh, like that, and they do have a core problem they want to solve for their business, they're just looking for you to solve their problem, and they're looking that you support them. Um, so they're looking for technical support and all the rest. So they want the whole package. They, they're trying to outsource the problem. They want this problem resolved. But then they don't want... Uh, like uh, that, This came up a bit as well at the EAG uh, workshop with Matt and that discussion afterwards. Like I think it, there's a big, big sort of problem culturally out there that pe when people hear open source, that basically means, oh, like you know, some PhD student or someone that's hanging around for a few weeks, knocks together it's something like code gets thrown over the fence or whatever, and then you're on your own. Like, you know, you just get on with it, okay? And it's just that, that's that's interpretation of what it means. When that's that's it can be the case. I'm sorry, I'm quite sure it happens quite often. But there's absolutely nothing stopping you building a business around it where you do have proper technical support, mm -hmm. uh, like you know, and deep technical support. So, like I think a phrase that was thrown at me quite a few times that I, that I love, but I, and I think it really goes to the heart of the matter, is to have a throat to choke. Uh, and you can really sort of appreciate the business mentality because they're trying to outsource this thing. They just want their problem solved to get their business done, and and they just what this little gizmo, whatever it is that does blah, that's important for their business. They need to make sure, look, this damn thing, one, it needs to work. If it doesn't work, I need to be able to phone up to someone and get them to fix my problem and come in here and get the damn thing fixed or whatever. And when we need to, when we need to plumb it into some other bit of software, there needs to be a guy that we can get to do it as well. Mm -hmm. um, so, so this I think was a big lesson that we learned was actually just finally look, just set up a company, get it properly set up, get all of this infrastructure in place, get all of the legal framework and tra contractual frameworks in place, um, mm -hmm. so that you, yeah, you literally do give them the draw to choke, and then you, uh, like, you get you get the whole infrastructure thing working. And I think once we had that realization, then the rest was actually pretty easy. There is a the the thing that I then sort of struggle with. As a sort of um, uh, amateur business person, <laughs> I just anyway is uh, I I then really struggle with feeling like I'm kind of you know you're 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 pitching the client then on this you you I feel like you're almost saying to them yeah we can give you this solution but we're sort of pushing you into this multi-year relationship with us because this solution will never stand alone by itself and you'll have to come to us for support. Do you know what I mean? There's this kind of tension then between, I mean, I absolutely think that good, like, just like you say, solving this problem requires that ongoing relationship. There is no thing that anyone can just throw over the fence, as it were, and then problem solved and off you go. Uh, but, but from the point of view of sort of Pitching them as an honest person who just wants to help them, I really struggle with this feeling that I'm coercing them almost into this multi-year relationship. Like my perception is that the big companies like Slumbershift, that, that's part of their whole business model. It's like, I don't want to sell you a piece of software, I want to sell you a five-year support contract, right? Mm -hmm. And I, I, I feel like that's, I don't know, I'm, I, I feel conflict about that, I guess. 
But I think so. The way I so I understand exactly what you what you're saying, um, and and but and I think I've actually seen this from the other perspective as well, because like say as I said earlier on, like you know we spend most of our time in, in perpetual failure as it were, like you know not getting traction, and I think one of the fee one of the bits of feedback that we're always getting is well oh yeah well fine we might uh, start using this tool we get our people like you know trained using and all the rest like that is actually already a big internal uh, investment from the company mm -hmm. to train their people up and start using this and start to become independent upon it, building their workflow around it. And then you might like you know bugger off and disappear like you know the, the, the next year. Like so so if you're an academic you just might have seen something else like you know sparkly and interesting and you go off researching that mm -hmm. uh, other exciting thing or like the grad students bug off or like so on and so forth. And this actually is what we what we were finding to be one of the major concerns that people had. Um, so what we found is that we had to be very, like you know, um, we had to be very forthright about, like you know, creating an entity that was clearly going to be lasting for a few years, and then at least then internally in the company, when they were able to say, oh, actually, you're not going to disappear after six months or a year, like you know, this is something that's sustainable. Then they were actually quite happy to buy in. So we're not actually okay. telling them it wasn't so much. Well, so far our experience has been. That hasn't been so much of trying to force them into a five-year commitment or something like this. It's more about giving them reassurance that there would be that level of continuity there. Yeah, I feel like um, there's a subtle difference then between a sort of consulting firm, which is kind of what I am, um, where we don't explicitly say, you know, these are our products we will support these products, do you know what I mean? That they, these products have roadmaps mm -hmm. and, the, and a software company that might have a, a suite of tools that they are either implicitly or explicitly committing to support for some period of time. Mm -hmm. maybe, maybe that's, there's a, there's a positioning issue there and maybe, because, uh, you know, I think one of the things about that you start to realize as you get away from kind of writing software for fun or for grad school or whatever and into business is that actually technology is a really small part of the solution to most problems, right? Mm -hmm. Like you say, there's, apart from the software-y stuff like documentation and tests and um, that kind of thing, there's also the cultural side and the training uh, side and the support side and marketing and all the other, right? The, the technology is actually a tiny component. And yeah. we're all on this kind of journey, I guess, of, um, becoming uh, creators of sustainable technology solutions, not just little pieces of Python code and GitHub. Do, do you know what I mean? Um, so mm -hmm. that that's my attempt at an elegant segue from talking about technology to talking about teaching students to code and what the role that you as a professor, uh, you know, a quote unquote professor, um, and um, and people like I that are interested in training as well can play in helping a new generation uh, find work and reward as scientists. Um, and so, because I see you're doing some software carpentry type training at Imperial. So, how is that going, and how important do you think that is for the next generation of scientists? Yeah, well, I think I think this is interesting for a number of different different reasons. Um, so, like I say, when we so I started teaching this a few years ago, um, and then one of the big one of the big difficulties was uh, getting people to accept that we would do this inside Python, uh, which was seen to be like you know people say no 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 what do you mean like you know you should be teaching them all like you know C plus plus. And uh, like, and there was this lack of understanding, like you know, for people that like how many years of investment it takes to become like you know a real sort of expert in programming like C plus plus, like another like now how not to actually program garbage in C plus uh, plus, and be productive, um, like the, yeah, there's a whole lack of understanding of that, and particularly when the, when all of the students we think about, say if we're thinking about like exploration geophysics or I mean you're more thinking about an employed sector. Um, like this is always a minor that what they're doing. Like it's already in a packed curriculum. Like they're off doing stuff on rocks and everything else. Like you know, so like your programming is only something that happens a bit more on the side. 
Uh, and I think there's a potential there for a crisis because, like, there's no doubt about it. Like, the entire economy is coming more and more digital. Like, you know, so like the dog in the street knows this, and uh, like, you know, it's 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 very well covered by like, you know, like a, a mountain of government reports about how the economy is increasingly digitalized. Um, but and and the people always talk about a skills gap as well. Like, there is a skills gap. Like, you know, because most people, like, you know, uh, yeah, they just 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 don't have the the skills really required. Like, we we know we know. Like, particularly you guys know. Like, you know, you're sort of seeped in 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 technology and doing software and that, and you already know there's such a gap between what people do in practice, like you know, from day to day, and what they could do if they got their act together and really sort of use the stuff that was there. There's a massive, massive divide, a massive opportunity. But the fact is, we pretty much we did the, the army of people that's required to create all of this stuff that don't exist. Now, I think the saving grace, there is a saving grace, though, is, uh, and like I keep saying this, like, you know, technology, like, you know, it doesn't suck as bad as it used to. Um, <laughs> like, because seriously, like, if you go back a few years ago, and, uh, like, you know, if you wanted to do scripting, like, you know, you did uh, Visual Basic or you did Perl. Um, and like you know, people used to have poetry competitions with Pearl, like you know, because you could put that thing out. And uh, the alternative then was uh, like Fortran, uh, like you know, C, C plus plus and stuff. But again, like you know, you're looking at like you know, do you have a really expert C plus plus programmer? You're talking about someone that's taken a major in it and probably has five years experience. Like you know, it's a massive undertaking. Uh, and it's an awful lot of code. Uh, like it's an awful lot. So if you want to talk about agility and creating stuff, it's like a nonsense. But the fact is, like, the fact is, like you know, Python and like you know, talk about Julia if you want. But like you know, these high-level things, they're taking the world by storm. Um, you have these like you know, uh, great frameworks like uh, like you know, TensorFlow and everything with beautiful Python interfaces that allows you to use uh, like you know, use uh, like like you know, tens of thousands of processors on the cloud like you know, to do your stuff. Like it's all there, and it only takes a few lines of code. And like and it is a few like you're you're doing you're you're able to do really disruptive, massive stuff on supercomputers, like you know, using um, like maybe hundreds of lines of code, like you know, once you're using the right once you make the appropriate technology choices <laughs> whereas like you know just go back 10 years ago you'd be writing all of this stuff in a god awful fortran or something and like goodness knows how many hundreds of thousands of lines of code you're buried in now the interesting thing is industry today like if we tell well, like not not mentioning names but like you can pretty much say everyone like you know has got this mass massive technical uh, debt okay you're, you're like I'm Irish I don't pronounce th's so you're gonna have to deal with it uh, but like they have this uh, legacy of software that like they're, they're, that was written like you know 80s 90s like the guys have retired half the have for, the, the associated with half the code and people are worried about the rewrite of that and so on and so forth. Um, and, and I really think that on one, on one hand, this is really worrying for business. On the other hand, I think for, for emerging or for small businesses or that, I think this is a really disruptive time. Uh, and all it really requires is people say, well, you know what, there is actually new technology. Maybe we should actually use it <laughs> to, yeah, to, right. to do this stuff. And uh, you, you'll be agile and you'll simply outpace the legacy stuff. But it's interesting uh, when you mention the new high-level languages uh, and... Uh, our, goes back to our conversation before, where uh, scientists and domain experts can now make production level things work, um, and that is pretty powerful. I mean, when you have when you don't have to have the computer science guys in the middle, um, mm -hmm. man, you you can get some speedy results from the top people in the world, and that, that's exciting. And again, good for me because uh, mm -hmm. I'm not a coder. <laughs> um, but you are like you're making the decision there, and I think uh, like I feel quite strongly about this. Like one of the th when I'm teaching programming now, and like I teach numerical methods and that, and like I like I, I still have arguments with people about this, but largely like I avoid uh, and I tell them explicitly not to write loops. So people say, oh, you should like write out a loop in full so they'll see how to use a such and such numerical methods or Gaussian elimination. And I'm there like no, like this is that's stupid. Okay, they're geophysicists. They want to invert 
something. You show them where to look up, find a library, so your form, your system, and you pass it into this thing that will solve it. Much, you much faster and using much better methods than what they will ever know how to do because they're never going to major in that subject. And is that sort of so? I think there's a there's a, there's an element of that uh, pragmatism, like you know, coming in slowly but surely, and a slow realization. You know what? We don't actually have to write like a hundred thousand lines of uh, Fortran, whatever, just because we want to write some solvers that thousands of people have already written before us. Yeah. If there's a student, it's, it sounds like you're running an amazing program over there for the students. If we, if we have students right now who are listening who, who are looking for internships or potentially looking for uh, uh, graduate student positions over there, are you guys looking for people? Yeah, sure. Um, like, always drop me an email. Um, the, the, the best people, um, I, I should warn, if you want to, eat it to to do one with me, though, you need to be persistent, because I, I, I'm not always very consistent in replying to my emails. <laughs> uh, Maybe um, due to the fact that you're an academic and an entrepreneur all at the same time. Yeah, so, uh, yeah, by, by, by all means, if anyone's interested, email me, and if you don't get a response, email me, email me a second time slightly more abrasively, and, uh, like, you know, I'll definitely get back to our, like, you know, our, uh, our Twitter or whatever. Like, you know, I, I, I do, um, I'm, a, I use, actually, Twitter is a good way of contacting just to have a quick blah because I reply because, like, you know, who doesn't use their phone in the toilet, right? Right. And uh, our GitHub, like, you know, so there's a lot of great, great people out there. All my stuff on GitHub is uh, open source. Uh, really, really keen to have, to involve people. Uh, we we usually don't bite, um, so like you know, so so even if you if you if you weren't coming as a as an internship per se, but you just wanted to do a project together or try stuff out, like you can always interact with us on GitHub as well and uh, Slack and everything else. Cool. Um, so. Okay, so there, there's links to um, your email and your LinkedIn there on the show notes, and your Twitter is also there on the show notes. So I encourage people who are looking for positions to uh, to get in touch. And if they're not looking for positions and they want to work on some weird little project, uh, GitHub's on there too. Um, <laughs> Gerard, it was awesome to have you on the show. Uh, we covered a ton of stuff, and uh, it was a lot of fun. Oh, fantastic. You know, it's been a lot of fun too. Yeah, thanks a lot. I, I actually spent a few hours listening to well, I uh, listened to your back catalogue to see <laughs> what I was getting myself into. So but yeah, like I think I think it's great. I think it's a great ongoing conversation to have. Excellent. Well, thanks for coming, and uh, audience, we'll see you next week. Yeah, thanks. Bye.